like Andrew said, my name's Heidi, and I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about my own personal experience with cancer. I started off a pretty normal kid. I was never sick a day in my life. I was happy and healthy until I was about nine and a half, and I started getting fears at nighttime and started getting very fatigued. My mom realized that this was not normal, so she sent me to my family doctor to see what was going on. My family doctor did a couple tests and then sent me to another doctor who did a couple tests, who sent me to another doctor who did a couple tests, who then sent me to a pediatrician who did a couple tests, and then she referred me to sick kids in Toronto to have a bone marrow aspiration, hoping they could figure out what was wrong with me. So on February 29th, 2008, I had my bone marrow aspiration at 11 a.m. And by 6 p.m., I was diagnosed with ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. You never forget the moment when you're told you have cancer. For me, I was sitting in this hospital room with this horrible wallpaper all around me, and my doctor came in, she sat down, and she said, Heidi, you have leukemia. You have cancer. And being nine and a half, I didn't actually know what cancer was. All I knew about cancer was, you got it when you're old, and old people die. So I asked my first question, am I going to die? And my doctor looked at me and she said, Heidi, we are going to try our best not to let that happen. And then I have a very vivid memory of myself thinking, this is some BS. I am a child. I should be out climbing trees. I shouldn't be sitting in this hospital room dying of something called cancer. But the truth was, I wasn't a kid anymore. I was a person fighting for my life. So my battle began. I was admitted that night and started chemo two days after that. My protocol was two and a half years of intense chemotherapy. The easiest part of my treatment was chemo every night, steroids five days a month, blood work every two weeks, chemo that was put in my port cath every two weeks, and chemo that was injected into my spine every month. During my career as a cancer kid, I like to think I was pretty stereotypical. I had a big, shiny, bald head and big, rosy chemo cheeks. A good comparison would be, I look like Charlie Brown. And then the summer of 2008 happened, my first summer on treatment. I became very, very sick, and I was admitted to sick kids for the whole month of August. During this time, it became evident to my doctors, to my family, and to myself that it was most likely going to be the last month of my life. So during this time, I met with a child life specialist. And a child life specialist is someone who helps children deal with illness and hospitalization. So my child life specialist came in and we started talking about what you talk about when you're dying, which is family. So she asked me about my family and I was showing her them in this photo album that my sisters made for me when I was first diagnosed. We're flipping through and then I flipped to a picture of my mom and my two sisters. And at that point, the waterworks happened. I broke down. Tears were flying everywhere. And my child life specialist asked me, Heidi, why are you crying? And I said, well, I'm going to miss them so much. And my child life specialist looked at me and said, Heidi, you're not going to die. And what she probably meant by that is I wasn't going to die right at that moment. But what I took it as is, even if I had died that night in that room, in that bed, I wasn't just going to die. My family was going to live on with only the memory of me. And then I realized I was not okay with that. I wanted my family to watch me grow up and become the individual I wanted to be. I wanted to watch my sisters fall in love for the first time. I wanted to fall in love for the first time. And whether that had actually anything to do with it, or medical miracles do actually happen, I was basically on the road to recovery the next day, and I was discharged within a week of that. I am very lucky and very privileged to say that on Mother's Day in 2010, I was able to finish all of my treatment, and to this day, I've been in complete remission. say to me, dude, you survived cancer. That's cool. Not everyone gets to say that every day. 
But it's important to make the clarification that I lived through childhood leukemia. You see, when children have cancer, it's a lot different when an adult have can has cancer, because as kids, our bodies are growing fast, which means our cells are reproducing at a rapid rate. And chemo's job is to come in and kill the cancer cells. But it also kills the surrounding cells around it. So, to this day, seven years off treatment, I struggle with every day, heart damage, brain damage, and bone damage. I will not be able to have kids when I grow up, and statistically, I will have another cancer by the end of my life. So it is safe to say that I am living with cancer. It is the first thing I think about when I wake up and the last thing I think about when I go to bed. But if we're being completely honest, I wouldn't change it. You see, people say I'm crazy when I say this, but cancer is actually a strangely beautiful thing. It's a thing that has given me the most incredible opportunities. It's a thing that brings out the kindness and the courage and the strength in every single person it affects. And don't get me wrong, I know the pain and the hurt that cancer brings. I felt it myself. I've lost family to it. I've lost friends to it. In fact, I lost my best friend to it, to a brain tumor. But do I regret having cancer? No. Because if I didn't have cancer, I wouldn't be traveling across the province speaking to thousands of youth this month. I wouldn't be here speaking to you all today. Cancer has this amazing ability to connect people. It's the reason why we've taken time out of our busy lives to decide that we are going to run a Relay for Life this year. I always say that it's not about what you have. It's about what you do with what you have. I am an 18-year-old teenage girl. I stayed back for an extra year of high school to save up money to travel. I'm running a Relay for Life for the second year at my high school. I give my mom way too much sass at times. I fail tests. I go to parties. I just signed with the Trent University women's volleyball team. <laughs> I don't have a boyfriend, but there's still hope in the world. That's what my mommy tells me. My point is, is that I'm you. I'm the person sitting next to you. But what I have is I have the experience of fighting cancer. And what I'm doing with what I have is I'm sharing my story. And I'm hopefully inspiring you to share your story. Because everyone has an experience of cancer, and everyone has a story. And everyone's experiences and stories deserve to be told. And that's why Relay for Life is such a cool event. Because it's not just an amazing fundraiser, and it is, trust me, we'll get into that later, but it's also an event that symbolizes what cancer treatment is like. When you start your relay this year, you're gonna be pumped. You're with your friends, music's playing, you're ready to go. You're thinking 12 hours of this, piece of cake, no problem. And then you start. And the first couple hours, they're okay. You're still, you have lots of fight left in you, you're still thinking, I got this. And then you get to hour six, halfway there. And at this point, blisters might be starting to form on your feet. Your back might be starting to hurt. Your head might be starting to ache. The people around you might be starting to get a bit annoying. But you keep going, because you're only halfway there. And then you get to hour seven through nine. And at this point, the blisters on your feet have formed. Your back is hurting. Your head is aching. The people around you are annoying. But you keep going, because you still have a little bit of fight left in you. And then you get to something called your hardest hour. And your hardest hour is the point in cancer treatment and in your relay journey that it would be a lot easier to stop and to quit than to keep going. But if you take anything out of my speech today, please let it be this. When you reach your hardest hour, keep going. Because cancer treatment takes endurance. I'm going to show you some of the endurance that it takes. What I'm about to show you, they're called bravery beads. So each bead on these strands represents a needle, a chemo, a transfusion, a procedure, a disease I came up with while going through treatment. Anything that I had to endure while going through treatment are on these strands.
So this is actually only a year and a half of my treatment. So there's still almost a whole other half um, that aren't on strands yet. So as you can probably see, um, cancer treatment is not easily fought. It takes everything you've got. It takes your family, it takes your friends, it takes a community. So when you push through your hardest hour, you are showing people that you're not afraid to fight back against cancer. When you push through your hardest hour, you are showing people that you are willing to continue to fight for those who can no longer do so. When you push through your hardest hour, you are showing your friends, your family, your school, and your community that cancer should be the one fearing us. By taking on this responsibility of running a Relay for Life at your high school, you are bringing people together. And when we come together, we can see that we are stronger than cancer. So on behalf of myself, the Canadian Cancer Society, and every single person I've known who's been affected by cancer, thank you. Thank you for taking on this responsibility. I wish you all the best of luck with your events. I wish you the best weather possible and happy, happy fundraising. And lastly, thank you for listening to my story. Thanks, guys. <laughs>